Good evening, everyone. We'd like to welcome you tonight to our Wednesday night Made New Bible Study. We have been doing this every week for quite a while now, taking a look at the Word of God as we are disciples of the Lord Jesus. We find that studying the Bible together has enriched us and laid a foundation in our hearts and in our lives about who God is and how we should live for Him in this world as we live together as the body of Christ. We are grateful for God's Word that we can study it and be students of it. It has so many things to teach us, and tonight we're going to jump into our series on belief while we are looking at the most basic ideas of what does it mean to really believe in God? What does it mean to put our confidence in God? What does it mean to put our trust in God? The last couple of weeks we looked at the book of James, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, where we looked at what it was like to face the test and to face trial while we're living in difficult times. Tonight we're going to go with the next step, and we're going to look at having faith, the simple idea of belief, but we're going to look at it in the context of how do I believe for my future, or as we are calling it tonight, how do we have faith for tomorrow? And it's important to us that we do have faith for tomorrow because we face things in life that make us think, oh my gosh, is tomorrow in jeopardy? Will tomorrow ever become real to me? Are the things that I'm hoping for and dreaming about and longing for in my life, are they coming? Is, is God going to help me bring that to pass? Is, is the things that I have seen even in my prayer and hoped in my heart and that I believe God has promised me, will those things be real? Because we find ourselves in life often having a promise of hope sitting out there, but there's this in-between stage of where we are now waiting for that promise or that day to arrive and living in this day that isn't living in the full reality of what we hoped for and struggling to believe for it. As we look at the Word of God tonight, we will find that people in the Bible suffered the same things or went through the same situations that we go through, where they were living in a moment of life that was less than ideal, not what they hoped for, and even less than what God had promised, but they had to hold on to their faith and hold on to God and believe that what he said he was going to do and that what he promised he was going to bring to pass. So let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Jeremiah, the chapter 29, verse 11. And this is one of the most powerful verses for me personally and for many people I know in the Old Testament because it speaks so clearly of God's intent for our lives and the way he sees us and he encourages us to see our future and to see him and to see ourselves in our present circumstance like he does. And so it simply says this in 2911 of Jeremiah. He says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. Isn't that amazing? I just want to say right at the beginning here that God has a fixed intention about how he sees your future, and he never has another view of it. He's not looking at us and thinking, well, I'd like to do that, but maybe not. I'm picking and choosing different pathways. Depends on how you live, how you operate, on what I will give to you. That is not God. God's word tells us that God is not moving around and vacillating and changing positions on how he sees us and sees our, and sees our future. He looks at us from a singular point of view that says, I have determined that your future will be blessed and that you are not going to have a future of calamity and you're not going to have a future of struggle that takes you out, but I have a plan for you to give you a hope and a future that has your good in it and has your welfare in it. That doesn't mean we don't go through trials and that doesn't mean we don't go through battles. But what it means is that whatever we go through, God's intention is always the same, that there is something else coming. And as we learned last week in the book of James, the trials are just preparing us and training us and getting us, and getting us ready for things. But God's intent is not just to live in the trial forever. He has a plan. He has a future and he has a hope that he is living in that he wants us to live in. A little background in the book of Jeremiah. We're talking about Jeremiah the prophet who is one of the major prophets of the Old Testament. And he lives in a very interesting time in world history. Just a little bit of uh, context, 
about where they are living in the day this book is written. And if you just pay attention a little bit here, I think you'll see that it might help us and make sense for our lives sometimes as well. But he's writing a letter or a prophetic word, in this sense, really even like a pastoral letter as much as a prophetic letter, to the nation of Israel. And what has happened is, is because they had walked away from God as a nation and, and had abandoned the altar of the Lord in turn to serve false gods, the Bible says that they were taken into captivity. And the captivity they specifically went to was a place called Babylon. Babylon means confusion. And so they had been sent to a very difficult place where there were false gods, false religions, things they had not known. And they were stuck in this very confusing place. Babylon, again, confusion and mixture. They were stuck living in this place of confusion. And they were longing for their home of Jerusalem and Israel. But because God had prophesied through another prophet, Daniel, that they would be in exile for 70 years. And then after 70 years would complete, uh, excuse me, after 70 years were complete, they would return. Until the 70 years had finished, they could not come back to Israel. They were going to stay in Babylon. And this is where it begins to get interesting. Because while they were in Babylon, false prophets begin to rise up and say, it's going to be great. Babylon's not going to be a problem. God's going to come and deliver us out of this. It's going to turn quickly, and we're going to go back to Jerusalem. But the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and said, not so fast. They are not going to come back to Jerusalem until what I said through Daniel comes to pass, and they have to be in Babylon 70 years. After 70 years, they will return. But in the middle of that time, of that 70 years, they had to live in Babylon. And this is what's interesting. Earlier in the chapter, in 29, and we don't have time to read it now, but the prophet says, because you're not going to leave the place of exile quickly, be there and believe for the people you're living with. Pray for that nation. Have children. Get married. Give your children in marriage. Be productive and be prosperous because the day that's coming, when you leave Babylon, you're going to need to be ready to take on your next assignment. And you're going to have to have a family. You're going to have to have kids. You're going to have to have wealth. You're going to have to have relationships. You're going to have to have strength. And if you quit now and give up now, you will not have what God has given you in your future. And so he writes this letter, and he says to them, I know it's hard where you're living. I know Babylon's difficult. I know times of confusion and mixture are difficult. But stay loyal and stay the course because there's a future coming. Because there is a future coming that's greater than what you're living in now. And you have to have hope and believe in the midst of, in the midst of your battle. Because if you will hold on now, you'll be ready for what's next. If we forfeit our hope now and we surrender our peace now, we won't be ready for what God is sending us. And so he tells them to believe and to hope that God has a plan. So let's just put that in our context for a moment. Maybe your personal life, where we are with the COVID-19 crisis, uh, where we are in uh, world history, where this nation is. It could be a hundred different things. But oftentimes we feel like we're exiled, we're outside of the promise that we're hoping for and that we're believing for. And then the Spirit of God comes and he reminds us of the scripture and he says, hold on. I know that something else is coming and I have a better day for you. And right now I'm preparing you for it. Believe me and hold on to your hope, and I will sustain you and see you through. I remember as a younger man in my late 20s and my early 30s, it was a long time ago, but it was a pivotal point, and I put that number, that age, in this story for a reason. There are different times in life where scriptures meet us and mean something to us. I know many of you that are watching also share, like I have, a very intimate personal history with this passage. Because this scripture has sustained us through difficult seasons of life and has held us together and been a promise that we could lay our hope upon and wrap our hearts and our lives around to believe God that what he said is going to come to pass. And so look at what he says here. We're looking at the notes that are available to us. And he says, for I know the plans that I have for you. Let's just start with that idea. God knows a plan, and he doesn't have it for a bunch of random people. He has it for you. There is a plan with your name on it. There is a plan with your family in it. There is a plan for the prosperity of what's coming in the future. There is a plan for your life to have purpose and meaning. There is a plan that God has and it was designed for you, your family, your friends, your church. He has designed it. 
He has created the plan. It's not our plan. It's his plan. And he has a plan that he is holding on to and he is actually working on in our lives right now. It's clear and pre it's clear and predetermined. It's a specific, it's not generic, it's a specific plan. And the plan is for each person uniquely and for the whole body of disciples at the same time. So what does that mean? You may be living your life here in California or somewhere where you live, and you are working something out. And God is specifically working in your life to create a purpose for you, and he has a plan for you, but you are also connected to a wider body, and he has a plan for them too. And so your plan is part of the plan he's working in their lives. And what's going on in that plan has direct effect upon your life. And so God is doing something in us in our lives right now, but he's also putting us in a bigger mission and a bigger mandate called the kingdom of God and the message of the gospel. And so God speaks to us and he says, I have a plan for you and it's a part of a much bigger plan. Your plan, our plan. He's working both at the same time. Wherever we are as a church right now, in this year, in this time in world history, God has a plan for us too. He has a plan for Bread of Life and every other minister and church watching this. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for you as a person, and he has a plan for your church, and it's to not live in the exile season forever. What do I mean by exile? What I've been saying is a place of in-between, of there's a promise, and it's coming, but it's not yet. We're believing God for something to happen, but God is getting us ready for it. And so we have hope instead of saying, it'll never come to pass, what's the use? Or God's going to get us out of here quickly and having a bunch of false hopes that God isn't doing it that way. If I stand up and say, this is all going to change in a few minutes and God's going to reverse all this, no one would believe that. But if I said, what if God was working in our lives and training us and teaching us right now and getting us ready for something else? And we need to understand that this season has great purpose. And it might not be over in a few minutes, but it's not going to go on forever. And we're going to live through something and be ready for what's next because there's a plan in all that as well. And it has to do with many people's lives and a great harvest of people coming to Jesus. Isn't that exciting? Why is this important? As I go through the difficulties of life, I know there's a plan, and I can have a thing called peace, and I can have a thing called rest. When I look at something I don't understand, I can say, Lord, you have a plan for me to give me a hope and a future, not for calamity and destruction. I look at the, um, let's take a look at point two here. It's declared by the Lord. I love that. It's declared by the Lord. It's not declared by the government. It's not declared by some person that we don't know or some fickle individual. It's declared by the Lord. And I just want to take a look at this scripture for a moment in Numbers 23 and verse 19. This is a powerful statement. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Or has he said, and he will not do it? Or has he spoken, and he will not make it good? God is declaring there when he speaks something and he says something to us, it isn't something that he's going to have to take back later because he didn't really mean what he said. If he said it, he meant it. And if he meant it, he is going to see it through. That is a powerful thing. I want to live in a place where I'm living out of what God said and not what man said. It's what God said that matters. It's not what man says. It's what God says. And so if God has said, I have a plan for you, it's for good, it's for your welfare, not for your calamity, I need to stake my life on that and live with that as a foundation under my feet. Hear me in this, friend. Do not move off that foundation no matter what you're facing. Apparently, people in Jerusalem that were struggling and then the people that were in Babylon that were living in exile we're all having this thing where they were beginning to cast doubt on God. And they, were beginning, and they were beginning to accuse him of being unfaithful and saying, well, maybe he's abandoned us. But then God, spe- uh, then God speaks to Jeremiah and says, I've not forgotten you. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, to give you a hope and a future. The promise came from God himself. We need to not move off that position. Let it become stability underneath our feet. As we go through this next season, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you've got this. And you have us. I know the plans I have for you, 
declares the Lord. Let that sink into your spirit. I remember as a younger person when I really discovered the power of this passage. I would sit in my room or I'd be down at the church and I would just weep for hours over the power of this revelation. It's hard to not do that in this teaching because this is one of the most intimate verses of my heart because it has sustained my life through many, many seasons of trial where when I had nothing else, I had God and I had his word. And that doesn't mean my friends didn't love me and that doesn't mean they weren't with me, but there are things where not even your friends can help you. There are places that we face in life that no matter how many people surround us, nothing replaces the Lord himself. We have to have our friends but we really have to have the Lord. It's that inner point of our heart where God ministers to us that we need the strength. Point three says, plans for welfare and not for calamity. His plan is for our provision and our support. Man, we need to know that. His plan is not to rob us and to cause us to dry up and die. His plan is to provide and support us. God's idea of welfare is for us to be complete and at peace, by the way. When you look up the word welfare there in the Hebrew language, that's what it means. It means that you would have peace, rest, and everything would be as the way it should be. Now, you could say, well, of course, that means that we'll have eternal life with God and we'll have perfect rest and perfect peace. That's true. But can I encourage you that in this life, God at some point wants to put you in a place where everything's working. Everything's at peace, at least peaceful enough for us to be able to live in this gospel mission and live in this kingdom mandate. I have lived in seasons of great stress, and I've lived in seasons of great peace. You have to have peace at some point in order to think clearly and to work soundly in the day that you have in front of you. God is not intending that we just have pain, 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 and then it's over. He is working to help us. I'm not saying he's going to make all of our dreams come true. But I am saying what his word is saying, that God's aim is to get you to a place of stability and clarity where things are working and you're clear and you're at peace so you can operate out of the power of God and bring the gospel to a world who does not have peace, who does not have rest, and who does not have hope. God has a future for us, and it has good things in it. It has good things in it. It's to be complete and peaceful. He's not planning our devastation or our demise. Let's look at this, Psalm 91, for a moment. I love Psalm 91. This is sort of personal testimony teaching, but I remember in my early 20s, I was about 20 years old, when I began to read this passage and study it at length. And I had a, a cassette that my mother-in-law had given me. She wasn't my mother-in-law yet. She was my girlfriend's mom. And she had given me this cassette that had been recorded by Calvary Chapel in the uh, late 70s. And they had uh, their take, they wrote a song, and they had a, t a version of their take on Psalm 91. And so you have, you know, acoustic guitars and late 70s Jesus people style music, and they were singing word for word out of the New American Standard Version, Psalm 91, uh, verses 14 through 16. And I remember that I had a job where I had to drive, and so I put the cassette in my car, and I would listen to this worship cassette over and over again, and whenever this song would come on, I would just bawl. I would sob and sob in the car, but I try not to now, and it was like God's word just washed over my heart, and he made promises to me. Look at this. It says, because he has loved me. Do you love him? I love him. He says, therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. Oh, I love this. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. Does that sound like God has pain and just calamity and problems in store for us, that he's just going to give us this terrible future. He says if you've loved him, he's going to deliver you. He's going to set you in a place of security because you've known his name. Oh, I love this passage. I love God's word. I love Jeremiah 29. I love Psalm 91. It says in point four here, he wants to give you a future and a hope. God is constantly working with our future in mind. Everything God is doing today and working in right now, it is for your tomorrow. He is working on things right now for the benefit of a day that's coming. 
You don't realize it, but even unseen, even angels on assignment, things are working in other parts of the world, maybe even in your community, for the purposes of God in your life. And though you don't see it, he's working because he has a plan, and that plan, and that plan didn't just get invented a few minutes ago. That plan has been in his heart before the world was made. It was in his heart. It has been in his heart and in his mind since you were born, and he has been working that plan all along, and right now it's working. He is working on a plan and a future, and he never gets off of it. We should know that and have confidence in God. His desire for us is to have that same hope living in us that lives in him. When you look at your future, do you look at it through difficult eyes? Do you see it through pain? Do you look at it and think, I don't know, I don't have any hope, or I'm concerned, or I'm scared? God says, I'm not. He says, I'm not scared about your future. I'm not worried about it. I'm not concerned about it like that. I see a hope for you. I see a plan for you, and that's all I see. And he's writing these words. He's saying, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, to give you a hope and a future so that it would enter our heart. So every day we get up, we would say, God has a plan for us to give us a hope and a future. Because I have known him, he will deliver me, and he has shown me his salvation. Praise God. That's exciting. And so when I'm tempted to believe something else or to be condemned, I can stop and think, even if I have made mistakes, that didn't change God's mind. You may be thinking, well, you know, I haven't done everything so great. I've done a lot of things that have hurt my future. Well, there is a law of sowing and reaping, and you may have brought some things into your life that God didn't intend. Does that change God's mind? Absolutely not. Can God work through those things? Yes. And especially if we'll own them and say, Lord, I missed it. I failed. I made a mistake, and I ask you to forgive me and to set me on a level path. Put me in your presence. I put your word in my heart, and let's start over. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, to give you a hope in the future. Even your mistakes cannot fully remove all that God has for you. And we need to trust God today and know that. These words were spoken to comfort those who thought that God had forgotten them. Have you ever thought that? Oh, I have. There's been many times in my life where I thought, Lord, are you still here? The devil lied to me. I was condemned. Things didn't go the way I thought they would in the moment. And I had to be honest before God and say, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for losing confidence. I'm so sorry for struggling like this and drawing back. I'm so sorry for acting like you had changed your mind. How dare I think of you like that? And how dare I, and how dare I speak to you like that? I'm so sorry. Forgive me, Lord. You are set on high. You are far above the earth. No man can change your mind. And even my little piddly mistakes are not enough to overthrow the greatness of our God. And to think that I could is a place of terrible pride. For me to say, God doesn't have plans for me that are good. God doesn't have a future for me with hope in it. It has calamity in it. That's arrogant. And it's proud to say stuff like that. Hum, humble ourselves under the sight of... Uh, we should humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord under the almighty hand of God and that he would lift us up. It was when I came to the place where I had to admit that I had taken the pain of my existence and set that upon God and made that the definition of how he worked that I could not believe Jeremiah 29, 11. But when I humbled myself and I said, Lord, I need to trust you and to not do so is to sin. And so, Lord, I surrender all my fear. I surrender all my pain. I surrender all my unbelief. I surrender all my sorrow and all my struggle. And I put my confidence back in your word. And I put my life back in your hands. I believe in you, Lord. I trust you. So let's look at these questions before we go. How familiar are you with the story of God's people in the book of Jeremiah? That's a great question. I would encourage you to take a look at this book and maybe a few other books of the Bible and see what was going on when the uh, Babylonian captivity was going on and what they were facing there. I would definitely take a look at the book of Daniel, who had to be a prophet to Babylonian kings. Take a look at the rest of Jeremiah. It's a powerful, powerful book that explains the nation of Israel's history and how God worked with them. Have you ever read the struggle they faced as they lost their way and had to return to God? The reason that's important is that we as people sometimes lose our way 
and have to turn to God. Nations can lose their way. Churches can lose their way. Families can lose their way. We live in a world that has confusion in it. Remember, that's what Babylon means, confusion and mixture. And as confusion is constantly working on us, sometimes we get buffered by that and worked over by it. And we have to say, God, we lost our way. Somehow we didn't mean it. We didn't think we were or we intentionally did. We lost our way. Lord, we come back. We come back and say, God, have mercy on us. We're coming back. Don't let us lose our way, Lord. Help us. How do you see your future? Question number two. How do you see your future? Just ask yourself that question. How do you see your future? Do you have things you say all the time? Oh, it'll never be good. It's going to be okay. Maybe not. I don't know. Or do we speak with vibrant hope and say, it's going to be great. Not because... You know, I have some false hope or I drank too much coffee today and I'm up and I'm happy because everything seems to be right in the moment. It's deeper than that. It's not some whimsical, oh, it's going to be all right. It's a deep-rooted, convincing faith that says the future is going to be good because God is in it. And no matter what we're going through, God is going to help us. It is not a life full of pain, as we're asking here. Do you see a life full of pain? Do you see a life that God is giving, that is full of good things and peace. Have you ever had a moment with the Lord where he came to you and showed you that he had a good thing for you and you had to admit you didn't see it or believe it and had to say, Lord, thank you for showing that to me. Thank you for having mercy on me and letting me know that good things are coming. Praise God. How much of your view of tomorrow is based upon the disappointments of the past? Uh Uh-oh, that's a huge question. Am I tempted to look at my future through the lens of my previous experience? And do I always read my previous experience well? Sometimes I look back and I think, God, you've been better to me than I thought you were. I'm still here. I'm still with the people I love. Yes, there's been turbulent times. It hasn't always been easy, but we're still together. You've blessed us, Lord. You've blessed me. I have to admit, the fact that you met me and spoke to me at all and that I could be saved and have a relationship with you, if you did nothing else, you've done more than enough. I'm not going to hell now. I have the intimacy of my God living in my heart, walking with me in my life. You've been good. Think about it. Has it all been bad? Or do we have an emotional response to the past that's not valid, or let me say it this way, maybe unfair or overblown. And then do we take our feelings about that and cast them into the future with an eye of disappointment and a spirit that says, what's the use? It's not going to work. God says, even in the midst of Babylon, even in the midst of confusion, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord to give you a hope and a future, not for calamity, but to give you welfare. That means sustenance to make you complete so that you would live. My friend, if you're looking at your future through your past, may I humbly and tenderly encourage you to lay that down, to lay that down in the presence of God and say, Lord, let me see my future through your word and through your promise and not through my view of the past or my interpretation of it, And if your past was hard, thank God that through Jesus, something else can happen. Something else will happen. God is at work. Praise God. If you have hope for tomorrow, question number four, how do you live with that hope as a daily lifestyle? Are you able to encourage others? That is another huge question. How do I live with this as a daily lifestyle and not just moments where I happen to touch it and feel better about it, and then forget about it and walk away and return to a place of despair or a place of losing my hope? How do I keep this as a daily life? How do I stay in a place of believing Jeremiah 29, 11 and holding on to what God said in the midst of bills coming in, news coming in, people coming and saying things that were challenging and difficult? How do I hold it together? Well, Jesus said, In the Sermon on the Mount, in the book of Matthew, in chapter 7, that when we put his words under our feet, it's like standing on a rock. And so that winds come, 
Waves come and rains descend. We are stable and do not move off the rock. By putting this word in our heart and letting it become an anchor of our faith and let it become an anchor of our reality, we as a daily lifestyle will live in a place of hope and peace because it guards our minds and it guards our hearts. What does that mean? Sometimes when I become tempted to be uh, confused about the moment I'm in and concerned about the future, I have to stop and say, Tom, get a hold of yourself. Stop where you are and remember what God said and go back to that. Get the book out. Read it again. Stop. And in the presence of God, say, Lord, I trust you. You are who you say you are. Forgive me for a moment of doubt. I surrender this back to you. And, Lord, I now put myself back in your hands. And I put myself back in your promises so I can lean forward. And like Paul says, I forget what lies behind, but I'm reaching forward and towards the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's a daily discipline that becomes a daily lifestyle that, could I encourage you with this, keeps you sane, keeps you stable, and keeps you, most importantly, productive in God because a discouraged, depressed person that's over in the corner will not be able to bring a witness of Jesus Christ to other people who are in the same condition. And I have had to learn that, that I have to become free in my heart before I can share Jesus with others. And I am so grateful that God came and met us and delivered us. So even when I struggle, I could come back to the Lord and say, God, I put myself back in your hands. And when people watch you do that, it encourages them to say, I could do the same thing. I could do that. If you can find God, and I know you're going through trials, and then God comes through and does great things in your life, what can that happen? Uh, what can happen in my life? What can that mean to me? And so our faith in God and our hope in God, even as we go through trial and come back and surrender to God and get back on the horse, so to speak, and say, I'm back in the race. Lord, I'm, I'm back in this. as my daily lifestyle. I'm putting my trust in your word, and I'm putting my life in your hands. People watch that and say, what do you have that I don't have? Because I see you going through what the rest of us are going through, but you're different. And then when they ask, you can say, well, friend, God says this about your life. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And when you open those words up, someone who is in despair that doesn't know Jesus, that's going to be like fresh water on dry ground. That's going to be like fresh oil on a deep wound. And there becomes the doorway of the gospel. This is how we show the people living in Babylon, this world we're living in, is very confused. We live in a Babylon world, eaten up with confusion while we're waiting for our future hope. But while we're living in Babylon, we're believing God that in this life, we will see the greatness of God. I would have despaired unless I'd believed I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, not just in eternity. Friends, God has something in plan. Uh, God has a plan and something in store for you and for me and for us. And today we're believing God. I just want to pray for you before we go and ask God's mercy and power to come upon you. Lord, I thank you for Jeremiah 29, 11. I thank you for the word of God. Lord, I thank you for every person watching this today. And Lord, we're asking that the power of the Holy Spirit would come upon them. Every person listening, that the anointing of God that came upon Jeremiah to write those words would come upon them to receive those words. Lord, that they would be received in the heart with power and and strength, and Lord, that the revolution that the Scripture produces in the heart of man would happen in the hearts of those who heard this today. Lord, we thank you that we can put our trust in you and that we can learn your word and trust what you've said and become clear and have joy and in the midst of confusion, look towards tomorrow and say, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. God is doing great things and he's not forgotten his plan. Why do we doubt? We thank you, Lord. We put our confidence in you. We put our trust in you, and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. I hope this has blessed you. Listen to it again. You may need to listen to this a few times. Get your Bible out. Take a long, hard look at Jeremiah 29, 11 and the verses that we listed in these notes. It's going to bless you. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.